Good morning, everybody. Uh, as I mentioned before, my name is Stephen Slater. I work for the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. I'd like to turn this over to the regional director uh, for Region 6. Sir, uh, we are we're ready for your opening remarks. Good morning, everybody. My name is Harvey Perriott, and I'm the regional director here at CISA Region 6. And on behalf of the Region 6 office, I'd like to extend a welcome and express my gratitude for your attendance on this webinar today. Most of you are probably already familiar with CISA and our mission to assist our public and private sector stakeholders with their security and resiliency efforts. I'm sure most of you are also aware of our security advisors. We have protective security advisors, cybersecurity advisors, and chemical security inspectors. I encourage you to go to our website at CISA.gov and look at all the tools and resources that we provide at no charge to our stakeholders. If you have any additional questions, please reach out to the CISA Region 6 office and you'll find the address at that website. With that, I'm gonna introduce our moderator today, Steve Slater with the National Risk Management Center 5G Initiative. For two years, Stephen has been a key member of CISA's 5G Initiative and has planned and coordinated over five workshops similar to the one today. These webinars are just one facet of CISA's multi-pronged approach to 5G security and resilience. CISA has developed the CISA 5G strategy, several risk assessment and educational products available on the CISA 5G website, and facilitated information sharing engagements with both public and private sector stakeholders. I too am very interested in our hearing about our 5G um, resilience efforts as we open up and, and, and learn to understand this new technology that is, is becoming rapidly deployed across the United States. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Stephen to talk a little bit about why we're here today and how we'll do it. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning to everybody here. Uh, my name is Stephen Slater. I work at the National Risk Management Center, as previously mentioned. When the 5G initiative was established within the NRMC uh, over the about two years ago, every agency and department across the U.S. government was engaging with domestic, international, private sector stakeholders and like-minded governments on five, uh, fifth generation technology. We at the NRMC kind of looked around and realized that no one was specifically looking to engage the state and local government folks. And we felt that was a gap that we could fill. So we, we established a, a series of webinars such as this one, an effort to provide just a basic level of education on 5G technology, the risks that are associated with 5G, and then start the conversation around what we call the information and communication technology supply chain. I just wanna reiterate that this is considered more of a basic level. We understand that there's a lot of information on this topic and there's a lot of depth we can go into. We only have a limited amount of time. We wanna provide you with some background information so you know what you don't know and know where you can go to find more information. So as you can see from the agenda today, it's pretty packed. Uh, we have a number of speakers, including two guest speakers from uh, Joint Base San Antonio's 5G program. We're gonna start with my colleague from the NRMC, Delena Hill. She's going to give us just kind of a brief overview on 5G and what it means uh, to the rest of us. Hi everyone, um, just a piggyback off of my fellow colleague Slater. We'll be going over our 5G overview today. Many may be familiar um, with the content and some information may be new. Roughly every 10 years, the next generation of mobile communication network is released, bringing faster speeds and increased capabilities. 1G brought our very first cell phone, 2G brought improved covers and texting, 3G introduced mobile data and enter access masses. 4G and 4G LTE increase speeds, capacity, manageability, and increase interoperability to keep up with the mobile data demand. The 5G generation of wireless technology delivers the age of smart devices, enabling a new kind of network that is designed to connect virtually everyone and everything together, including smart machines, objects, and increasingly the edge of cellular networks near to the end user. When fully deployed, 5G will introduce a wealth of benefits such as extremely fast download speeds, near real-time interactivities, and allow the connectivity of many more devices at once. These benefits will pave the way for new capabilities and support connectivity for applications like smart cities, autonomous vehicles, remote healthcare, and much more. 
When compared to 4G, fully optimized 5G will bring 100 times the network and faster speed downloads, 10 times decrease in latency, and three times spectrum efficiency, leveraging low, mid, high band spectrums to broaden capabilities and coverage. 5G network improves upon previous telecommunication technology, introducing new use cases, leverage more diverse spectrums and consist of different infrastructure deployment. The following slide will look at each of these differences more in depth. 3GPP is a consortium of standard organizations and groups that work to develop protocols for mobile telecommunication. 3GPP has grouped 5G's use cases into three distinct categories, enhanced mobile broadband use, a high band spectrum, and provides a great support for high data rates, providing consumers with faster, more reliable connection in crowded areas. Ultra reliable, low latency communication leverages mid band spectrum and covers a large area. Lastly, massive machine type communication provides connectivity to billions of devices that transmit small amounts of traffic through long, low band spectrums that can cover large areas. Unlike 4G LTE, 5G operates in three different spectrum bands. Low band spectrums is created for a nationwide coverage. Mid band spectrum is suited for a metropolitan network coverage and high band spectrum is the most talked about 5G band, often referred to as millimeter waves. The band spectrum unlocks 5G's greatest potential and is designed for a high density in urban areas. 5G's deployment will primarily operate on non-standalone networks relying on existing telecommunication infrastructure while providing improved bandwidth capacity and reliability on wireless broadband services. Interconnection with 4G components bring added risk to both generations of networks. The evolution of non-standalone and standalone 5G will gradually go into phases of progression. However, there are initial deployment being done already this year. Please review graphic below for a high level overview of how it works. Software defined networking refers to designing, building, and managed networks to be more flexible and agile. This process consists of separation of control planes from data planes or forward planes in a traditional network element, like switches and routers. With this separation, the control plane, which is more core intelligence of network elements, can move to a central place called the controller or network operating system. This allows network controls to become directly programmable where administrators through external controls will be able to manage 5G's network and make changes or introduce new services. The benefit of SDN includes lightweight, less expensive network equipment, efficient network utilization, centralizing network management, reducing efforts and improving scalability, vendor and interoperability. 3GPP is internationally telecommunication standard organization that has developed a series of release estimating the rollout of 5G. The timeline below of commercializing these releases rather than deploying outlines by 3GPP's timeline. Release 16 launches a standalone radio. Standalone 5G enables capabilities and remote driving smart city applications and industrial use of the Internet of Things. Release 17 intends to accelerate the expansion of 5G by introducing unlicensed spectrum bands. And Release 18 explores more vertical opportunities that 5G will offer. In order to access 5G's networks, users will need to have new devices that are capable to receive 5G's connectivity. With potential 5G sparks innovation across various industries, users will need to prepare for adoption of 5G's enabled IoT devices, network hardware components, and end-user devices. This can include industrial application and home routers and end-user devices like cell phones 
and wearable technology. While various forms of 5G are available in many major United States cities, deploying nationwide 5G coverage still faces numerous deployment challenges. Some of those challenges include infrastructure consideration, misinformation and conspiracy theories, operating and maintenance costs, and challenges with cybersecurity. For example, supply chain deployment, network security, and competition and choose vulnerabilities may affect the security and resilience of 5G's network. CISA participates in the development of the National Strategy to Secure 5G, which was a National Security Council-led effort to establish the framework by which the United States will safeguard fifth-generation wireless infrastructure at home and abroad. As the nation's risk advisor, CISA is leading risk mitigation efforts by working with government and industry partners to promote security and resilience 5G technology and infrastructure. The vision is 5G's connectivity that will enhance national security, technological innovations, and economic um, opportunities. CIS's mission leads 5G's risk management efforts to promote development and deployment of securing the resilience of 5G's infrastructure. Guided by three core competencies, risk management, stakeholder engagement, and technical assistance. CISA works to ensure that there are policy, legal, security, and safety frameworks in a place to fully leverage 5G's technology while managing its significant risk. CISA is currently developing a series of resources to serve as an educational tool to support the secure adoption and implementation of 5G's technologies. To access these resources for CISA 5G, please visit www.cisa.gov 5G. Thank you all for your time. This concludes the promise and reality of 5G's presentation. Back over to Slater. Thank you, Delana. Dr. Brian Kelly uh, is the principal investigator at Joint Base San Antonio and works in the 5G program. Doctor, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Stephen. And, and uh, uh, also uh, thank you, uh, Delana, for the great uh, presentation. Uh, so I'm uh, Dr. Uh, Brian Kelly. Uh, and uh, you, you're probably wondering why I'm, I'm equipped to speak to you today. So let me just give you a little bit uh, about my background. I did my undergraduate work at Cornell University, my graduate work at uh, Georgia Tech, and spent 10 years in the telecom industry working with Motorola, uh, where I was a distinguished member of the technical staff. I developed uh, telecom solutions as a principal architect. And I was also part of the standards body that is currently defining 5G. At the time uh, I was in the standards body, it was defining 4G. I decided to leave industry and accepted a position at uh, the University of Texas at San Antonio, where I teach courses on things like 5G, software, radio, and internet of things. Currently, I am the principal investigator uh, in 5G for Joint Base uh, San Antonio's uh, 5G core capability and security program and their 5G telemedicine program. So I'm going to give a little bit of background uh, to you first about 5G, what it is, because there's a lot of information on 5G and I want to try to organize it for, for you so you can uh, try to understand why it's so important. Let me just try to um, explain what's happening and why there's such a sea change in terms of how we look at technology and, and what 5G can do. When I talk to students, what I the way I describe 5G is you can think of 5G as a mobile version of the internet. So what's essentially happening is the first generation of the internet was essentially a fixed computer network uh, uh, implementation, but everyone had access to it. We could plug into it through uh, ethernet cables, we could connect our computers to it. Uh, many of us now use Wi-Fi to connect uh, to the internet. What 5G is doing is it's kind of a network behind the network that enables you to connect. So if we think more uh, specifically, if you look at the diagram in the top, you can think of the top 
uh, portion of this triangle is the internet. Attached to the internet are data networks, cloud systems, all the applications online that we're used to getting. Then if you go to the bottom left, you can think of that as 5G. So the bottom left of the triangle is 5G. We normally access 5G systems through what's called a radio access network. These are the big radio towers that you see when you're driving down the road, you see this huge monstrosity of a tower. Right? These are the 5G towers or the radio towers that we get uh, cellular communication access through. Behind that tower sits your uh, telecom provider. If you go to the middle, uh, that's where we have what's called the 5G core network. So your telecom provider behind the wireless access that you get when you're uh, connecting your phone or you're in your vehicle and you're connected uh, to your cellular service is what we call the 5G core network. Now, one of the things that changed this core network is now a cloud-based host platform. Uh, and this cloud uh, host platform hosts now communication services. So 5G is basically, you know, cloudified communication. So you can use commodity uh, servers, commodity computers to process the 5G communication signals that 5G uh, and services that 5G offers. To the right is something that you may not be aware of. 5G integrates other networks, including things like Wi-Fi, as part of its native services. So it considers non-5G networks what we, uh, as a, a key uh, element. All these things uh, support some of the applications that you see on the right. Things like augmented reality, uh, wireless robot factories, where robots can be reprogrammed over the air, where uh, robots can move and still have a connectivity and perform the operations that they do. Uh, in terms of augmented reality, these are normally those 3D goggles, if you look in the upper left. Uh, and when you put them on, you can project digital images over uh, realistic backgrounds. Uh, so for instance, in the future, a mechanic, right? They may have uh, uh, normally three, three different vehicles of makes and models of car that they're an expert in. But when you put on these 3D augmented reality goggles, the system can give that same person the ability to, to uh, access three-dimensional images of a car's parts processes for, for repair uh, so that that same person now has access to literally hundreds of vehicles and how to repair it. So that's just one of the examples. There are also are connected vehicles and things like telemedicine that 5G enables. Uh, so when we think about 5G, uh, it's not just a standard in the United States. One of the key things that makes it so powerful is that 5G has enormous economies of scale. In fact, it's a worldwide standard. Now, the explanation of the ecosystem of communication standards that 5G integrates, is just immense. There are groups in Europe, groups in uh, China, in Japan, in Korea, and in the United States, as well as in South America, that basically come together every three months as part of a standards body known as the Third Generation Partnership Project, the 3GPP. How do I know this? Believe it or not, when I was in industry, I was part of the Third Generation Partnership Project. I was part of the standards body defining, again, the 4G standard. I traveled uh, all across Asia, uh, Europe, Eastern Europe, as well as the United States to attend and participate uh, and promote uh, new standards. So that standards body is known as the 3GPP. It integrates so many different standards that once you buy a 5G phone, that phone is essentially capable of operating really anywhere in the world, presuming the local operators have enabled that specific phone type. Uh, so at Joint Base San Antonio, uh, I am the uh, principal investigator of a 5G network program that is experimenting with what we call private 5G networks. So currently the US government is developing experimental 5G networks 
that can be used for private operation for the Department of Defense, but also for other government agencies uh, uh, as well. And uh, we're working with uh, you know, commercial uh, industries and universities and research institutes uh, on this effort. One of the efforts that we are embarking on relates to the use of 5G in telemedicine. Now, within the 5G standard, it supports many different applications, including applications in telemedicine. So just as I mentioned the mechanic in the prior uh, scenario, uh, another scenario would have a doctor using 5G. So if you look in the upper right, if we take the 3D augmented reality goggles, these are basically head mounted goggles that, that are used. If a medic or a physician, let's say, comes upon a patient uh, and needs to treat them, one method of treatment might involve uh, expertise that only a specialist has. So the specialist can essentially uh, put on head mounted goggles. The, the uh, on site physician or attending medic can put on head mounted goggles and be led through procedures in real time using 5G connections wherever they're at. And so these are some of the things that we are uh, investigating in our experimental network at Twin Bay San Antonio. What you see in this diagram is the uh, connection of systems that can be assembled in order to set up a network in real time. So in an emergency, in environments that don't originally have infrastructure, we can actually set up a 5G network quickly to enable that kind of service, uh, such as uh, connecting augmented reality solutions to 5G networks. So when we think about 5G, think about it as more than just a network that connects to phones. Connecting phones is a uh, important service but 5G enables many different kinds of services to be connected to it wherever you're at, at a really high data rate that starts to um, compete with traditional internet connectivity data rates. One other thing I want to mention is this network that we're developing is what's referred to as a private 5G network. So what is that? Wi-Fi. When you buy a Wi-Fi system or Wi-Fi station or access point uh, for your home, you just set it up, you plug it in, maybe you call your, your uh, Wi-Fi provider, you, you dial in a, uh, you know, passcodes and a few other things, and you set up your network. Well, 5G is attempting to do that as well. So in the future, you may be able to set up your own uh, private telecom network that has service coverage over a wider region than something like Wi-Fi. One of the key elements to that that I wanted to cover today is this concept of standalone versus non-standalone. So what is what is the difference? And this is think of this as a 5G 101, right? So I want to discuss a key element that most people are not aware of that really differentiates our 5G networks. So that that difference is the the uh, concept of standalone versus non-standalone. So when the developers of the 5G standards were deciding on which technology to deploy. One of the considerations that needed to be addressed was how do we define the uh, backward compatibility with 4G networks? So when we set up 5G systems, we can't just set them up and say no 4G or prior uh, generation phone will, will operate, we set it up with this concept of backward compatibility. Hence, believe it or not, most of the phones that you're using today, if they're 5G phones, don't actually take the full advantage of 5G. Most phones, as they were initially deployed, there was a recognition that many of the networks that we still uh, connect to are 4G. So the connection between 4G and 5G was resolved in the standard spotting, known as 3GPP, by creating a, a transitioning standard referred to as 5G non-standalone. So in this diagram, if you look at non-standalone, essentially what it is is non-standalone allows you to connect to a 4G network using some of the components of 4G. 
And as network operators upgrade to 5G, then they can have mixed components of both 4G and 5G operating concurrently in order to uh, support roaming between 4G and 5G or access to 5G. Standalone is really the full pure capabilities authorized and enabled by the standards body known as 3GPP. So actually, most of us are not using right now the full capability of 5G, but we will as, as 5G gets rolled out more and more. So there's a notion of sort of releases and time, but there's also a notion of releases of the standard in terms of which option to deploy. So in this diagram, you can see in the middle, top middle is 5G standalone. So 5G standalone has, remember the network behind the network I discussed before, it has a 5G core network, uh, which is basically the, the highest tier of 5G connected to a radio tower known as a 5G new radio uh, access tower. So therefore there are mixed deployment standards occurring right now. And these mixed deployment standards enable 4G and 5G mixing and matching. JBSA 5G, uh, in the effort that we are pursuing in terms of an experimental 5G network, uh, we're deploying the most advanced system, and that's referred to as 5G standalone. So if you look in the diagram, 5G standalone uses what's called a 5G core network or 5G C network, as opposed to a 5G evolved packet core network or 5G EPC network. And there are all sorts of mixes and matches that occur in between. So option two, is the most advanced uh, option and it supports again the highest data rates the lowest uh, latencies uh, and, and many different capabilities so just what can 5g do okay so i talked a little bit about 5g standalone so what does this give you in the capability of doing well there are three main modes of 5g envisioned by the standards body one mode is an ultra high data rate mode, and that's referred to as enhanced mobile broadband. So that high data rate mode can support rates as high as 20 gigabits per second. That is ethernet-like speed, but occurring wirelessly. That's in the top uh, portion of the document. In the bottom left, there's another mode of operation. Uh, many of you may have gone to events, you pull in your, your phone, and you know there's so many people trying to connect that you have difficulty sometimes getting attachment. Well, 5G has a mode of operation that supports up to a million devices within a kilometer square region. That's kind of the ultra dense mode of operation known as massive machine type communications. And then in the bottom right, there's a mode of operation where we know that there's a, a need for a rapid low latency communication from the network to the device. So if you're controlling something remotely, like if you're controlling a drone, or if a surgeon is controlling a robot, a, a surgical robot remotely, then we need really high reliability with very low delay, which we sometimes refer to as a latency. And these modes of operations support everything from voice services to sensor, networks with large numbers of sensors, 3D cameras, industrial robotics, and many more. So as I mentioned to you, uh, there, there are three main modes of operation defined within the 5G standard. Uh, there also are enhanced security capabilities in 5G. So believe it or not, 5G has better security than the 4G standard. One concern, however, is because more people are expected to be using 5G networks that uh, any security breach is obviously significant. So those are areas of uh, security that we're also experimenting with and investigating as part of our effort uh, at, at Joint Base San Antonio's 5G uh, program management office. Uh, in the upper right, uh, it shows sort of the gap uh, in terms of capability between what the prior standard known as 4G is doing and what 5G is doing. So throughputs up to 100X of what 4G uh, supports are, are what we're uh, aiming for in 5G and very low delay. And when we talk about low delay, think of that as having the ability to tactilely control things remotely. When you think about 5G's benefits, because most operators and most of your phones right now are not using 
the most high tier capability in 5G, you're going to see increasing amounts of capability occurring uh, over 5G networks and, and, and with services that you connect to 5G uh, in the future. Believe it or not, 5G is also the lowest cost solution. And you may wonder, well, how is that possible? It's a new standard. Well, 5G chose to use commodity servers, commodity computers to host many of its applications because it doesn't require specialized compute equipment uh, for most of its communication services, it's actually lower cost. It also supports native operations used in the cloud and application community. So it can take advantage of many of the cloud applications that are out there. It supports low latency and has uh, other sort of network uh, interface capabilities that really uh, allow it to connect. So 5G is really the hub of the advancement of the internet to mobile spaces. So when we look at 5G, then in conclusion, what we can say is it allows advanced mobile applications on the cloud. Uh, it integrates also uh, wireless access, computer networks, uh, and intelligence services. And if you look at uh, if you look at the diagram that's shown, some of those intelligence services involve things like intelligent AI services. So uh, systems are, are capable of, in some sense of thinking for themselves. Uh, and what you see on the bottom is a another application uh, enabling uh, the uh, communication of 5G and Wi-Fi simultaneously to your end uh, device. Um, so with that, uh, I will return uh, control to uh, Stephen Slater. This is Dr. Kelly and I uh, appreciate uh, your, your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. Uh, we have a question. Um, it says, are there any 5G specific security recommendations for DNS configurations and or routing protocols for tower and core network equipment? I'm gonna give you the opportunity to address this. And then I think my colleague in analysis division may have something to add on as well. Yeah, yeah. So 5G has standards for security that it promotes. It also tries not to uh, prevent advanced security. So there are security architecture standards in 5G that enable what we call concealment and other sorts of uh, things uh, that also support encryption and other sorts of uh, security standards. Ah, thank you very much. Uh, Ryan Orr is on the line from our analysis division. Uh, Mr. Orr, was there anything you wanted to to add on to that to address this specific question? Specifically to uh, DNS in particular, you know, I think uh, things like 3GPP, which Dr. Kelly just went over very well earlier, you know, things like network slicing, things like um, orchestration, for example, those are all covered in 3GPP. Other things like the ITU, which is out of the EU, um, also is heavily involved in standards. And there are standards that develop, and those standards do things like technical specifications. And it might not be directly related to DNS, but they do support security within DNS. Yeah, let, let me just add to, to that. that. That is a really good point. So, so there's a group known as the International Telecommunication Union, the ITU. Uh, they tend to specify like high level goals for future uh, standards that the 3GPP develops. Uh, the 3GPP refines that into operational standards uh, and you can get to their website at 3GPP.org. With regards to uh, what was just mentioned about network slicing and, and other uh, technologies, the standards try not to define exactly how you will secure your network. What they do, however, do is tell you what's compliant to network security. So there are there is a standard, and uh, I, I don't remember the standard uh, uh, numerology uh, off the top of my head, but there, there are security standards that you can access that will help uh, interface uh, with, with uh, DNS or other sorts of uh, uh, services uh, that you, you need to uh, gain access to. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kelly. Uh, we have another question. It says, oh. will the widespread implementation of 5G infrastructure have any okay. effect on the time it takes carriers to potentially implement 
intercarrier roaming under disasters as agreed to in the wireless resiliency cooperative framework. So with regards to roaming itself, normally that's defined under what's referred to a service level agreement. Roaming is a little bit, it involves both standards and sort of business operation relationships because normally with roaming, different operators have to agree on how users will sort of move between the spaces of the network. So many of those concepts are defined in what are called service level agreements. There also are often uh, industry best practices and standards that are applied and industry alliances that if there are some elements that, let's say, are not completely specified in the standard, many of those industry alliances will often give uh, information on sort of best practices uh, to enable that. The answer is effectively is um, there are service level agreements that typically define roaming and those agreements uh, tend to be uh, interoperator specific. I see two questions um, asking about 5G interference with aviation. I don't know if you want to address that question. It is kind of an elephant in the room. I'm happy to take it, but I'd like to take it at the end. Uh, we have we have some talking points, as you can imagine. Okay. Uh, but they're not going to be very um, in depth, just due to the the issues at hand with regulatory agencies and the industries in which they regulate. There have been some uh, questions, and I actually I've read the report and analyzed it, believe it or not, uh, on this particular subject. Uh, effectively, uh, there was a study done by a group uh, sponsored by the um, FAA. Uh, that analyzed uh, the uh, impact of, quote unquote, impact of 5G on what are called altimeters, which relate to the uh, systems in planes that look at the height of the plane relative to the ground uh, below, uh, important for landing in particular. The, the report expressed some concerns. There's nothing inherent about 5G that creates uh, additional issues uh, associated with altimeters or anything else. There were, however, some uh, what are called spectral bands, or these are the uh, frequent, frequency ranges in space that we operate on. And some of those ranges were a little bit closer to some of the um, bands that, um, that are used by um, th these devices for, uh, for planes. And so I think that's kind of what the report effectively uh, pointed out, which is that you know, when, when you move the bands closer together, that uh, sometimes uh, they, they express some concern, hey, there may be some interference. It turns out that uh, all around the world, <laughs> they're using the same standard and everyone's landing planes. So I, I think uh, no matter what the uh, concern is, uh, it's it certainly is uh, something that, you know, it, it's nothing special to 5G. It's, it's simply a, a controlled interference uh, sort of issue that can be uh, dealt with with normal practice effectively. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, appreciate okay. the insight there. Uh, with that, I'm going to transition us to the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Clarence Huff uh, has a presentation on what is called the Open Radio Access Network. Sir, thank you for joining us. And uh, please, we are, we are very excited to hear about Open RAN. Thank you, Stephen. As uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kelly, spoken to earlier, I am also in the Joint Base San Antonio 5G PMO office. I'm the principal systems engineer there uh, working for uh, this effort with the under the Office of Secretary of Defense Research and uh, Experimentation. We, as you said, we are working in many areas and one of the areas that I am mostly involved with among with is looking at how the overall system will come together as well, and not only the network, but applications uh, that will run on the system and things such as common operating pictures, maps, push to talk, cell phones, as well as things that you normally would do in your daily job with productivity software. One of the things that we wanted to look at, as Dr. Kelly had mentioned earlier there, was it, what is this cost that it's going to be? And when we look at the radios, that's the thing on the outside. That's the, you very see, very seldom see them. You drive by, you might not even notice them. But in order for this 5G to really take uh, 
uh, home and uh, really be, uh, I say, a, a big advantage for a number of people to using it other than their cell phones that they're using. If we wanted to make sure we can digitize a city to where you are walking into the city and have a, the capability to get instant updates from advertisement, as you've probably seen in some of the movies, as, as you're walking from store to store, you're getting advertisement to smart technologies there. Well, they all need radios. These radios there were brought up with uh, standards from these uh, radio systems. And one of my areas I looked at was what was a way that we could find benefits to creating a low cost test bed that would demonstrate the benefits of ORAN capability. And ORAN itself uh, has a, a website that's out there that's loaded with the architectures and the uh, specification on how it's all set up and what it really means to connect various radios. Here, back in the earlier days, what you had probably seen was you had a bunch of systems by different vendors that just run a gamut, whether it was in the 5G core areas, and then a bunch of radios that was out there, and then it was a bunch of user equipment that they had, all out and connected, using specific things. There was no standard. You could try to deploy a new radio, and I was speaking to a small carrier yesterday up in the Colorado area, and he was just informing me just what, what difficulty he was having with having his old radios connect with a new core, as well as the new uh, mech that he had had installed, and it was just a disaster. It was very limited interoperability. Integration was just killing him, and the innovation just, he didn't see the benefit of it. Well, when you look at the standards that are out there from the ORAN specification and everything, one of the things that they have done is to say, okay, if you follow these standards and your operating system or your network that you have, your core is there and you have the latest version was 16 at the moment and if you move on to 17, of course, as you get higher, there's going to be with 16, 17 or 18, whatever that standard come out, it is going to have better specification and better enhancement because here's what ORAN is really telling you that you will be able to do. Market competition and your customer choice is just going to open up. You have lower equipment costs because now you can get a radio that will match with various ORANs as well as various cores. One of the thing, a much needed thing they will have is about the interference and especially controlling the spectrum access because various radios will only broadcast and receive and send out in the different spectrum piece. Right now, the, the biggest one that's on the market right now is the C-band that Verizon and all the rest of them are, just came out with. And that interoperability is what we noticed in our lab that we was doing, it really works. We was able to take something like a Polaris core and connect it with an Ericsson type radios that they had what was running originally in, with Ericsson core. And we switched it out with a Polaris. We've also switched it out with an open 5G open source, not the NSA. There was and, and there are some software updates that need to take place with the radios, but we was able to get that upgrade the radios and the Polaris and the other one was able to uh, interoperate without a problem. Well, not necessarily not a problem, but it took a little coding, but it was able to we was able to get it done without going back to the vendor and asking for a lot of help. Our outtake of that was ORAN definitely will be a nice improvement that will allow you to take your user equipment, connect to a cell site that is out there, or whether you have things up in the cloud that you're using and this software that is definitely that works on one piece of the system with its functions, whether your core, but your, again, your core has to have the capability to connect. Yeah, I'm not saying you can just get any core and put out there. If you follow the standards and have the right core, it will connect to a specific 5G RAM with the Geno V 
and whether you have your different pieces with your OCUs or the open RAN distribution unit and your radio unit, it seems to work without a problem. One is a solution that we looked at is when you want to virtualize your ORAN system is whether you want to use things in the cloud, have it on the edge, down closer with your, your mech that you are using, or whether you're going to have something out further with uh, a front hole with your cell towers is out there. In this particular notion architecture that we've laid out here, the system we uh, wanted to test and to see how things would work was using various users equipment. Our users equipment that we had was a number of cell phones, Samsung's S21's and iPhone 12's that we tested in the San Antonio area that we had out there was able to uh, function without any problems that we could note. When you want to do a specific, and this is the area that we also looked at in the lab, when you wanted to look at a way to deploy using various implementation based on the ORAN guides, they published six major deployment implementations that are labeled like A through F. And one of the two, uh, two of the ones that we looked at was a scenario B, which looked at enhanced mobile broadcasting where the CU was in the regional cloud, the DU was on the edge, and the RU was right at the site there. Or the scenario D, which had the cloud, the physical pieces that was there on the edge and a cell site. Both very easily to do, not only on the outside, but is I think one of the things you could do if you don't have all of this equipment ready to go, you could use emulators to put this together and see how the effects would be in both of those areas. And there's a number of vendors that you can get to use your emulators if you don't want, if you don't have or understand how the actual ORANs themselves would work, you could go to one of these emulator vendors and get this equipment set up in a lab without having to purchase all of them and take down a specific radio if you don't have them available. But in our lab, it was uh, something we definitely are continuing to work towards. And we see that emulators definitely will be a, uh, play a major role when you, before you deploy any type of system and have a specific scenario that you want to set up. These are a number of the systems that we've looked at for evaluation, various cores that we've had, different mechs for our edges there, two most popular ORANs that we've looked at at the time has been with JMA Wireless and Dell. There's also some combination here with a vendor that you might not have known is the Cypress there um, that Dale has partnered with as well. Uh, Cypher's itself is a piece that is very similar to Ericsson and the uh, way you can maneuver around using its system with various, uh, the core, uh, they have two major pieces. One is a deployment piece and then there's an enterprise piece, but knowing how the core works is, is not far off that you can test and do a number of things with it as well. But again, in the UE side there, those vendors there uh, doing emulators or if you don't have enough telephones or anything you want to do your test, Keysight is uh, definitely one that will allow you to emulate up to a couple of thousand UEs and see the effect on the systems that they have. This has been, I think, one of the most eye-opening pieces there is having that capability to mix and match these different pieces. And I'm quite sure there's other open cores and as probably more people get an opportunity to do testing, they themselves will find out that other cores will interoperate with various ORANs that are out there. And I think where the key takeaway that I want to bring from this is the radios themselves, 
with some software upgrades. And in some cases, you might want to not have your old radios due to interference, whether it's up linking or down linking, where the interference is going. And without a good spectrum analyzer there, it might be difficult to find out where the interference is coming from. Then this just goes back to the scenario. If your radio is probably giving you a hard time, I think you're probably going to, it's probably a time to think about upgrading or looking at another way to distribute the radios and using the wireless uh, millimeter wave uh, capability that's going to be coming out in the future to where you can not have radios that are not so close together, depending on the terrain that you're in. But you might need to rethink how the radios should be placed in your environment. So that's one big takeaway that we have seen with the way different systems are placed out there. And there's a lot of roaming that takes place with the radio. So your radio definitely has to have the capability to accept uh, various frequencies that it will be able to use in order to continue and not disenfranchise the different various users that are out there. And see, that was the simple part from what ORAN and what we have done at the JBSA site with our deployment and anything. And with that, Stephen, I'll see if we can pass this back over to you if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Huff. Fantastic presentation on, on this concept that is quickly emerging as the go-to for 5G. Uh, it has been a, a huge point of the, of the interna our international uh, push with 5G as well. We've talked a little bit about some of the, the great capabilities that 5G is supposed to bring, new and innovative technologies, new ways of, of living our lives, frankly. Uh, but one of the things that happens when we introduce this new te technology is the introduction of new risks. I work at the National Risk Management Center. As you can imagine, it, it takes a look at risks associated with national level activities, particularly in the critical infrastructure world and what we call the national critical functions. I'm joined today by my colleague, Mr. Ryan Orr. He also works at the National Risk Management Center and he works in our analysis division. And he's done some extensive work analyzing the risks to 5G and he's going to provide a brief presentation on them today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Orr and I'm a cyber analyst at NRMC, the National Risk Management Center within the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. I'm very excited uh, to be here today and I really appreciate the opportunity to brief you on why the Bengals are going to win the Super Bowl this year. Uh, no, just kidding. What, what I'm actually going to be briefing on is a lot more exciting than the Super Bowl. Today, I'm going to focus on 5G risks, particularly a recent product that we developed in coordination with the National Security Agency, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, as well as several industry partners that contributed to a group uh, that was called the Enduring Security Framework. Our particular working panel within the Enduring Security Framework was tasked with identifying threats to the deployment and the development of 5G. So as you can understand, that's a very broad ask, right? Like what are the threats from 5G? So we did our best to look at it broadly and take a holistic look at 5G threat overall. And what we did was we bucketed it into three primary areas. Those areas included policy and standards, supply chain and system architecture. Now, we then took each one of those three areas, each one of those buckets, right? And then we broke them down into more specific threat vectors. And then we developed illustrative scenarios for each one of the primary threat areas. And that was the idea behind the, those scenarios was to provide context and to make the threats more understandable and relatable, maybe for folks that don't really have an understanding of what 5G is. The first threat area that we identified is policy and standards. And policy and standards really are the backbone of what 5G is, whether they are identifying uh, you know, use cases for 5G, which clearly I outline how 5G will be used, or, or technical specifications right, that, that secures the actual data as it flows through the 5G network. Through these global standard setting bodies, like the third generation partnership project that was mentioned earlier, or the ITU, um, standards development really influences the design, the security, and architecture of 5G in any emerging technologies that utilize it. That's why it's so critical that these standards bodies and these policies that come from them continue to stay open, 
uh, transparent and consensus driven. So this brings me to our first of the threat vectors that we identified, which is open standards. Now, the potential exists for standards to include untrusted technologies and equipment that are unique to a specific company or country. Now, while most standards bodies are multi-stakeholder, uh, they're merit-based, um, these standards may still be influenced, which could put a trusted IT and communications organization at a disadvantage. Our second threat area is optional controls under policy and standards. Standards bodies basically develop protocols for mobile telecommunications, some of which contain security controls that are either required or optional, meaning that they don't ne they're not necessary to meet the standard, right? Should network operators decide to not implement optional security controls, you know, because they impact other systems in the network, or if they lock down protocols in the network that the network actually requires to function, it may make the network more vulnerable and at higher risk for cyber attack. For example, if there's a specific policy within your network, and you know that implementing the security control could possibly break it and influence the operations of the network, a lot of times system administrators just won't implement that, right? They don't want to mess with the policies. And this could be an easy way for a threat actor or a malicious actor to identify easy to attack vulnerabilities within the system and then take advantage of them. So this is one area that we would like to identify here that could be a potential threat vector for a malicious actor to take advantage of a 5G network. I mentioned earlier too that you know we also develop these scenarios. They're meant to provide the reader with like an illustrative understanding of a topic. I'm not going to go through those today. I um, just frankly don't have enough time to do it. But what we'll do is we'll share a link to the actual finalized product we put together so that if you're interested, you could read through the scenarios and of course, always reach back out to us if you have any more questions. The next area here is supply chain. And, you know, as we've seen with the recent attacks, right, like solar winds, for example, it's absolutely critical to identify threats to your infrastructure through the supply chain. A lot easier to say, right, than to do, but essentially entities could be exposed to supply chain risks through the use of 5G components that are manufactured by untrusted companies. Now, these risks may include the insertion of malicious software and hardware, counterfeit components, and frankly, component flaws, right, that are caused by poor manufacturing process and maintenance procedures. That's one of the things that we'd like to note here as well. As a potential purchaser of 5G equipment, if your system has a vulnerability in it, whether or not it's malicious sometimes doesn't matter, right? Like you don't necessarily care if a vulnerability is inserted maliciously or not. You just want to make sure that your device is secure, right? And a lot of times untrusted organizations or organizations that we identify as untrusted Sometimes they're more likely to have vulnerabilities inserted with them just because of poor software assurance or other things, other standards and, and other things that they just don't follow. So a lot of times there's vulnerabilities inserted both maliciously and inadvertently, which at the end of the day are still a vulnerability. So uh, within this area, supply chain, we identified two primary threat vectors, the first of which is counterfeit components. Counterfeit components are more susceptible to cyber attack, and they're frankly just more likely to break because of their poor quality. This is a particular concern when it comes to 5G because it's going to have such a larger infrastructure of components than previous wireless generations. So where 3G and 4G use like macro towers to send out a signal, 5G utilizes those small cells, right? Those things that we talked about earlier, which will be pervasive, they'll be located everywhere, um, you know, and they'll also be using these massive input and output devices or, and macro towers, right? So all of those heterogeneous different types of networking components within the RAN are going to create a, a larger area for attack. So ensuring that the device you buy is from a trusted component manufacturer or reseller is critical. And, you know, we also recommend, you know, not to buy devices from any untrusted resellers either. So not just, not just the actual manufacturers, but also the resellers. You want to make sure that it's from a, a trusted, legitimate source. The second threat vector that we identified under supply chain is inherited components. This is the one that really, you know, keeps me up at night. Essentially, threats coming from these extended supply chains consisting of third-party suppliers, vendors, service providers. This is the type of attack we saw with solar winds, right? Where a software component could have a malicious piece inserted into it and, you know, through the supplier or even through the supplier of the supplier, right? As you're starting to go down further within that supply chain. So the flaws or malware that are inserted early enough in the development of a product can make it much more difficult to detect right? It makes it harder to detect, right? Because because the, it could lead to the developer somewhere down the line marking that as legitimate through digital signatures or other approvals. So you end up having something that was marked as, as a legitimate product or software or hardware that's been inserted, and at the end of the day, it's not. 
and it makes it very hard to detect. So that's that's the one that, that really worries me. The third area uh, is uh, 5G system architecture. A lot of this was mentioned previously. Um, everyone did a really great job of kind of explaining what 5G was and the new architecture. But just to quickly recap, um, 5G was designed from the onset and uh, developed to meet these increasing data capacity you know, communication requirements. But there still could be legacy and new vulnerabilities exploited, right, by malicious actors within these. And two of the areas that we identified are legacy vulnerabilities, right? Um, you know, uh, Dr. Kelly talked a little bit about uh, 4G and how 5G is going to be built initially and for a while with that backbone of 4G, right? So we're talking about any legacy vulnerability within 4G could be utilized as a vector to target 5G systems. So that's that's part of what I'm going to talk about, and that's one of the things we identified. And the other area that we identified here is edge computing. So you'll notice that there are a lot more. We identified a lot of, uh, of potential threat vectors here with our industry partners and with our partners within the federal government. I'm just going to focus on these two today. But again, if, if you want to read more or learn more about them, you can check the product or always reach back out to us. First, inherited vulnerabilities. Um, and again, this was talked about earlier, but 4G has identified and very obvious vulnerabilities in them. We're talking about SS7, we're having, we're talking about a diameter protocol, right? These are the things that been have been, you know, exploited by malicious actors for 20 years, right? And they exist within 4G. And because of that, and because 5G is gonna be built upon 4G, at least initially for a while until it's a full standalone 5G infrastructure, it's gonna take a while. And those vulnerabilities are gonna be exploitable within 5G as well. So that's one of the primary areas that we identified and something to keep note of that, that those are gonna exist until we do have a full 5G infrastructure. Next, we have edge computing. And basically edge computing transforms the way that data is processed and stored, basically by moving some of the core components closer to the end user, like literally, physically closer to the end user so the data doesn't have to travel as far. That's basically edge computing, right? Just the distance between two points, making that smaller. In order to do that though, in order to make the, that distance smaller, you have to take core functionality and you have to move it into the radio access network, right? And this itself blurs those traditional networking lines, right? The, the, the difference between edge and RAN networking and the core networking all becomes blurred and you have those core functionalities put within the edge infrastructure or within the radio access network infrastructure. So that just basically creates another vector for malicious actors to target devices that are in the radio access network to reach core functionality. So that's another potential vector with 5G that we didn't see previously. That's that's, that's becoming a, a potential issue as we build more and more heterogeneous components and as we move towards shorter latency and less latency for users to, you know, so watch the Super Bowl or play video games, right? All that, all those key <laughs> critical infrastructure, uh, uh, you know, necessities that we have identified with 5G. So I've talked a little bit about this as we've gone through, but some potential consequences uh, should some of those vectors identified be exploited include, but really is not limited to the reduction of competition, right? In, in the 5G marketplace, compromised supply chains, improperly configured 5G systems, which are very likely to be easier to attack and easier to exploit. Uh, potentially more accessible core networking systems are another potential consequence. If left unaddressed, any of these consequences, it could lead to the theft of sensitive data and loss to service availability, degradation of customer and uh, stakeholder trust in the organization, right? It could also lead to the erosion of public, public confidence in the reliability of the networks. And that goes not just for the actual providers, but also the users, right? The, the, these companies that utilize 5G, it could really um, hurt them as well. So, and that kind of leads me to the next piece, which is you may be asking yourself after listening to the, the, the threat vectors and the consequences that I just laid out, what's the bottom line here? Because it's hard to hear something like you are more likely to have sensitive data stolen when you use untrusted components, and then, you know, distill that into something that's easily digestible, right? So, one way to help illustrate that is through cascading impacts, looking at not just that first tier consequence, but what happens afterwards, right? So as an example, you've been hit with a cyber attack and you've lost sensitive data for your customers. What does that actually mean for the organization, right? If a company is using untrusted components and is hit with ransomware and is down for five days, you can look at that and say, well, you know, we lost five days of revenue or our customers were unable to access the system for five days. However, there are a lot more consequences that come out of that that are just much more difficult to qualify and quantify, right? What are the costs associated with losing public confidence in your organization? What, what is the cost of losing sensitive information to a competitor or to another country, right? 
what are the long term effects of, of having untrusted components that require significantly higher security, uh, maintenance and labor costs, right? Because they do. A great example of that is the, the Huawei Oversight Board in the UK, right? The UK had Huawei in their network and they set this board up to review and ensure that security features they wanted were being implemented, right? And that they were and that Huawei was doing a good job of keeping their system secure. And basically after a decade, like literally a full, it was in 2010, I think when it was stood up. So over a decade of Huawei just simply not doing this and, and not securing the network in the way that UK wanted, they ended up just pulling all Huawei out of their networks. I think they're currently in the process of pulling it out. But the idea is they're literally just ripping and replacing that infrastructure. So you, you're looking at significant, you know, monetary costs, obviously, but significant other costs associated with utilizing untrusted components. So it's, it, which in turn can lead to increased vulnerability within your 5G system. So it's very important here to take that all into consideration. And, and the best way to do that, you know, for any system or component is to prioritize security. Get your components and systems through only trusted providers and make sure that you keep your systems up to date, your people trained, make sure that you're working with groups like uh, CISA, for example, who have experts in this area and that are willing to help and then wanna work with your organization to secure your infrastructure. Following that same kind of line of thought, next we have opportunities to mitigate 5G risk. Government and industry have the opportunity to work together to maximize the benefits of the next generation communication networks and really to promote security and resilience uh, associated with emerging 5G technologies. So given you know, the, the rollout schedule and where we are right now in the 5G rollout, we have a short window of time in which uh, you know, the US federal government and allied countries and uh, you know, organizations and private industry and uh, critical infrastructure can work together to advance risk mitigation efforts that may be more difficult to address as the deployment of 5Gs continues. Because I know we're short on time, but encouraging trusted development of 5G technologies, promoting international standards, continued engagement with private sector on risk identification, something that, that we are very involved in and work on a daily basis with our private industry partners, and uh, working to develop security capabilities that protect not only the, the 5G infrastructure, but also the applications and services that utilize it. That concludes my brief today. Um, Stephen, back over to you. Ryan, as always, your insight is is much appreciated. Thank you very much for your time today. We had a couple questions that I think are good, but I want to circle back to at the end. Um, one of the things that Ryan mentioned was supply chain. And before there was a 5G initiative, uh, CISA recognized the need to establish an effort for the information and communications technology supply chain. Joining us today is my colleague within the National Risk Management Center, Katie Willers. Uh, she is our lead for what we call the ICT Scrum effort. Uh, and she's going to provide a brief overview on the, her work with ICT Scrum, as well as some of the concerns that we have regarding it. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for letting me brief today. As Stephen mentioned, my name is Katie Willers, and I lead uh, the ICT Scrum uh, effort within CISA or within the National Risk Management Center. One of our uh, key items that we do is we lead the ICT Scrum Task Force, which is an example of a successful public-private partnership and includes 60 members from the federal government and some of the largest IT and comm sectors, se sector companies. And I will reference the task force as I go forward and its work during this briefing and all the products that I mentioned are publicly available on CISA's supply chain website. And many of the products are also complementary um, to some of the remarks that Ryan made about supply chain issues and concerns. But first, uh, what is the supply chain? Uh, the global supply chain model constitutes sequential multi-country production where value is added in fragments along the way and where the country of origin is often difficult to determine. For example, a product might be designed in New York, built in Vietnam, tested in Taiwan, stored in Hong Kong, sent to China for final assembly, and then distributed to consumers around the globe. And nothing has demonstrated the downside to such a supply chain model like the, the COVID-19 pandemic. The whole world lived through and continues to live through supply chain disruptions uh, that the pandemic introduced. Uh, we all remember two years ago when it was hard to find uh, PPE for frontline workers and consumers had trouble finding hand sanitizer and certain food items. And so the pandemic illustrated that the global supply chain is not flexible and it underscored the need for changes for how we manage our supply chains. And as Ryan indicated, the information communications technology supply chain faces the same supply chain challenges. All aspects of our lives are intertwined with ICT. Where would we all be without iPhones, iPads, laptops, electricity, due to the service that run our power grids, or even uh, cars, which include semiconductors to help them operate? 
And threats to ICT um, come from counterfeit components, cyber attacks, the introduction of uh, malicious software, and ransomware. And in addition to, in, in the case of counterfeit components, the compromises might be introduced early in the supply, supply chain and not noticed for years. As I previously mentioned, the pandemic uh, brought into view challenges to the global supply chains. But while previously I mentioned hand sanitizers and food items, the global ICT supply chain was disrupted too. The task force that I previously mentioned, and we'll explain at greater length shortly, examined these challenges related to COVID and determined that because of how the global ICT supply chains were structured prior to the pandemic, many organizations were impacted by three key issues. First was a reliance on a single source suppliers or a single region for supplies. The second was reliance on lean inventory models. So having enough inventory to meet short-term demand, but perhaps not enough inventory to meet medium or long-term demands if you no longer have access to your usual suppliers. And then the third issue were issues around supply chain transparency and understanding where junior tier suppliers are located. For example, you might know that your primary supplier for product X is located in New York, but did you know that that supplier's primary vendor for a major component of product X is located in China? The pandemic also brought into view supply chains and products are particularly critical and some of the risks associated for them. Obviously top of mind throughout the pandemic, as I've already mentioned, were the tangible shortage of critical products, such as PPE and food commodities. But there were also shortage of key Element, key elements of medical devices. For example, there was a fear about a shortage of mouse serum and what that could mean for the availability of basic medical testing devices, such as COVID rapid tests or home pregnancy tests, which depend on this mouse serum in order to produce reliable results. And then COVID also shed light on risks around logistics, transportation, manufacturing, warehousing that we all continue to experience and that have dominated uh, recent news cycles. But supply chain risks come from more than just global pandemics. There are everyday risks that all organizations still need to track and be watching. And I just want to share a couple of these risks of you through the lens of recent supply chain incidents. One impactful supply chain incident in the recent past came with a shutdown of the Colonial Pipeline in May 2021 as a result of a ransomware attack. And so this ransomware attack was due to a single compromised password that allowed hackers to gain access to Colonial's network through a VPN account. And so a ransomware attack like this is a cyber attack, regardless of whether it's targeted or how it's delivered. And the knock-on effect from the cyber attack was a supply chain disruption that led to gasoline shortages and increased gas prices up and down the East Coast. So this supply chain incident demonstrates IT security is not just a technological problem, but it's also an issue that could cause knock-on effects for physical commodities and supply chains, such as gasoline in this instance. Another recent supply chain incident is the current shortage of semiconductors, in part due to a large demand in the aftermath of the pandemic. So semiconductors, as, as you likely are all aware, are material basis for integrated circuits that are essential to modern day life. They're used in virtually every technology product and underpin state-of-the-art military systems. And so therefore, a decrease in the supply of semiconductors has led to a decrease in the supply of all of these products. And so, the industry is currently undergoing a shortage due to multiple factors, including unexpected shifts in global demand following the pandemic, but also it's been disrupted by other events. For example, there were storms in Texas in early 2021 that caused a shutdown of several semiconductor manufacturing plants there. Taking into account many of these supply chain threats, a primary step that DHS and CISA have taken to strengthen our nation's supply chains was to charter the ICT Scrum Task Force, which I've already referenced throughout my remarks. DHS chartered the task force in the fall of 2018 and is now led in partnership by CISA and the IT and communication sectors. And so the task force is the focal point for public-private supply chain risk management and allows government and industry subject matter experts to jointly examine and develop recommendations and policy initiatives to address key strategic challenges to identify and manage risk associated with the global ICT supply chain and related third-party risks. Some of the topics that the task force has looked at have included um, supply chain risk information sharing. It's looked at taxonomies related to supply chain threat landscape, and it's looked at developing tools to better assess the trustworthiness of potential ICT vendors. In addition, the task force has also provided subject matter expertise to the US government as, it, as CISA has responded to a couple of recent supply chain related executive orders, 
One was Executive Order 14017, which has looked at strengthening the resilience of U.S. supply chains. And there's also Executive Order 14028, which primarily focuses on cybersecurity, including sections focused on supply chain related efforts. And as, as we've hinted at, as Ryan has hinted at, and I, I have mentioned, in, in, in general, it's important for organizations um, to understand supply chain threats. And so to assist with this, the task force developed a lexicon of supply chain threats using feedback from stakeholders. And so it developed a threat scenarios report, which is, again, available on our website. And this provides practical example-based guidance on supplier scrim threat analysis and, eva and evaluation that can be applied by acquisition and procurement personnel during a source selection in order to assess uh, supply chain risks and to develop procedures to manage the potential impact of these threats. And so, and while the document was produced by the ICT Scrim Task Force, many of the threats within the report are also applicable to more than just ICT suppliers, products, and services. For example, insider threats can be a threat to many different types of organizations across many different sectors. I also just want to point out another couple resources related to the assessment of ICT trustworthiness. So as we mentioned, it's important to use trusted vendors because protecting your organization's information requires understanding not only your organization's immediate supply chain, but also the extended supply chains of your vendors and suppliers. And so to help organizations and businesses assess the trustworthiness of its uh, vendors, a couple of tactics that could be deployed by IT or cybersecurity personnel or acquisitions and procurement officials include first, an organization could use a qualified bidder or qualified manufacturer list for the acquisition of ICT products and services. One tool that could help with that is the task force released a report last April that was focused on mitigating ICT supply chain risks with qualified bidder and manufacturers lists. This report provides organizations with a list of criteria and factors that can be used to inform an organization's decision to build or rely on qualified lists for their acquisitions. And then second, organizations um, could consider and examine the risk management practices of potential vendors to determine what gaps might exist within their supply chain postures. So to assist with this, the task force um, developed the vendor scrim template, which provides a set of questions regarding the supplier's implementation and application of industry standards and best practices that could help guide supply chain risk planning in a more standardized way. While the questions were intended to help the acquisition of information and communications technology, there are many questions within the template that could apply to all potential vendors and therefore could be used by a wide range of organizations to assess their supply chain risk posture, or at least to serve as a starting point for identifying the types of questions an organization should be asking its potential vendors about their supply chains. And so finally, as as has been mentioned, uh, CISA and the task force have developed several products to help raise awareness of supply chain risk management best practices. And this slide includes some of these uh, supply chain resources. All of the resources, again, are available on CISA's supply chain webpage, and which the address for is here on this slide. Um, and then on the next slide, I believe, has our email address as well. You're welcome to email us with any additional questions that you might have. That concludes my remarks, and now I'd like to hand it back to Stephen. Katie, uh, thank you so much for the time today. We really appreciated uh, the insight into the complexities of the supply chain. So with that, we've concluded all our presentations today. Uh, there are a number of questions that were left in chat, and I'm, I'm going to leave the question and answer um, option open. While I address the one question that was asked multiple times, which was the aviation question, my remarks will be very guarded due to the situation as it is. For those who don't know, uh, the aviation industry has publicly co expressed concern over possible interference from the upcoming rollout of 5G network equipment that may utilize or interfere with frequencies that aircraft use to fly in particular with radar altimeters. These concerns were made publicly and there were a number of both public and private statements by all the parties involved, uh, aviation sector, telecommunication sectors, and the regulatory agencies that interact with them the most, which would be the FAA and the FCC. The telecommunications companies agreed to delay the rollout of their new 5G equipment around airports while the FAA conducts testing. Uh, if you'd like to know more about the FAA conducting testing, they have established an entire 5G webpage for this now. I would highly encourage you to visit it if you want more information on that aspect of it. CISA's role is that of the trusted information broker. We don't regulate very much. Uh, there's a small sliver of the chemical sector that we regulate, and that's about it. We don't have a lot of grant money, and that grant money is 
usually specifically designated by legislation as to what we can and can't use it for. We are the trusted information broker. We are able to interact with public and private sector partners alike, share information about risks, threats, vulnerabilities in a way that um, it enables a spirit of cooperation. Uh, so we've kind of held back a little bit because the appropriate authorities and expertise for 5G and aviation spectrum reside within the FAA and the FCC. And we will hold off until this issue is a little more resolved before engaging anyone involved in a more holistic manner. We are very encouraged, by the way, that the telecommunications carriers, the aviation stakeholders, and our federal partners have cooperated during this. It's a good sign to resolve this quickly and amicably across uh, the country. So that's all I'm going to say about that. If you want more, I would encourage you to contact the FAA or the FCC. Uh, we did have a couple other questions, and I'm going to go ahead and scroll through them now. I believe this question was intended for Dr. Kelly, and Ryan may also be able to address it as well. But it says, with regard to interference, what threats exist to private 5G networks, like the example of the standalone network displayed in the slide of the hospital? Specifically, could an adversary launch a, a denial of service or a distributed denial of service attack against a private 5G network used by organizations like Department of Defense? If so, are there basic countermeasures to address the DOS threat? Uh, Ryan, I see you popping up on screen. Would you like to take the first crack at this? Yeah, absolutely. To answer the, the first piece of that, uh, denial of service attacks can absolutely be launched against any internet facing infrastructure. So in the example provided, like a private federal 5G network, if it's publicly available, then absolutely, right? It could, it could definitely be hit. Um, likely though, if, if we were to kind of pull the thread on this example, um, if there's like a federal warehouse or something using 5G, it would likely be a uh, or very similar to a Wi-Fi network, right? Where it would be set up to enable all the different miscellaneous pieces of componentry within the warehouse to activate. So it'd basically be like that, got like a Wi-Fi network, but it'll be 5G, so it'll have increased capabilities. It would likely be secured and segregated outside of the federal network, but still connected and likely not publicly available. A malicious actor could definitely, you know, hit providers DNS servers, for example, but it being 5G doesn't necessarily increase or decrease that risk, right? Um, th th there are several mitigations right here that providers use and that, that we use within the federal government, things like DDoS uh, scrubbing services, for example. There's like cloud-based uh, DNS services that are redundant, right? So if something gets hit, they can transfer over or redirect traffic. And there's also like web protection services where, you know, websites and stuff are protected. But to sum up, uh, it's, it's unlikely that, um, you know, a 5G private network would have internet facing infrastructure. If it does, then absolutely it could be hit. But beyond that, um, there's nothing specific to 5G that makes it any more or any less vulnerable to denial of service. Excellent, thank you, Ryan. I have one more question in the hopper. The question is from one of our PSAs out in the field, Julio Gonzalez. He asks, who determines or identifies trusted equipment providers? Is that a government function? or up to private industry to identify. Uh, so I'm gonna ask Katie Willers to come on and help me answer this. Uh, primarily, when not dealing with equipment that is for the federal government, the FCC is the one who regulates that. They're the ultimate regulatory authority when it comes to 5G. They don't make that decision in a vacuum, however, it should be noted. They have discussions with federal partners to do risk analysis and assessments, and they also have conversations with private industry when they start the rulemaking process. In terms of for the federal government, I believe, and Katie, you can back me up on this, it comes down to the Federal Acquisition Security Council. Is that correct? That is my understanding. I think you've done a very good job of recapping. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. So at the end, it's it's usually the FCC. It is the FCC that makes that determination. They have made that determination on a number of components. They've published that and made it aware. And they have programs in place for the rural carriers right now if they're looking to rip out their untrusted suppliers and components and replace them with trusted ones. I want to take a moment to thank uh, Region 6 office, uh, for one, for arranging for some, some spectacular speakers. Uh, and Dr. Kelly and Dr. Huff. And I, I want to say thank you to you both for joining. I also want to provide you with uh, some available resources. So a lot of the analytical products that, uh, that Katie and Ryan discussed, they're available at the CISA websites. Uh, 
CISA 5G has its own uh, web page, and we'll provide the links here at the end. And the ICT Scrum has its own page. We have a plethora of resources, and they range from very basic things. You see there on the screen, it says 5G, the basics. That's a one pager that just kind of briefly describes 5G. But we also have some very in-depth analysis done in particular by Ryan on edge versus core. We talk about edge computing. Uh, we talk about the potential threat vectors to 5G infrastructure. We have a number of products we've done jointly with various government agencies and some private sector uh, bodies. So I highly encourage you to go ahead and peruse that site. There's a number of videos there as well. Uh, that will provide some more information. And if you have any questions, you can contact us at 5G at CISA.DHS.gov. And then for the ICT Scrum Task Force, they as well have their own uh, email box and website, as you can see on the uh, on the page. Once again, thank you all for attending. Thank you once again to Region 6 uh, for hosting us. To Dr. Kelly and Dr. Huff, thank you so much for your presentations. Thank you all for your time, and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Take care, everyone.